Hello, and welcome to the excerpt. I'm Dana Taylor. Fungi are among us more than we realize. From the backs of frogs to our own backyard, fungi, a largely neglected group of pathogens, are becoming a prevalent and widespread concern among scientists and health experts alike. The main reason? Climate change. Joining me today on the excerpt to discuss what's causing this explosion in disease-causing fungi is Dr. Arturo Casadevall, Chair of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Arturo, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me, Dana. We didn't care as much about fungi until recently. Why should we be concerned about their threat? So... The reason that we we need to be concerned about them is because even though fungal diseases are still relatively rare for most people, when they happen, they are of high consequence. They carry a high morbidity and mortality, uh, and they often are very hard to treat. One has to take antifungal drugs for a very long time. What role has climate change played in influencing the growth of infectious fungi. For agriculture, we need to think that the fungi are the major pathogens of plants. And what climate change is doing, first, let's talk about agriculture first, is that it is expanding the range of some of these fungal pathogens. And the reason that is a major problem for us is because they threaten agriculture, they threaten our food supply. When it comes to us, what we are seeing, the the role of climate change is is more subtle right now, but we think it's going to be a bigger problem in the future. And for that, Dana, what I'd like you to think about is that our temperature, we are 37 degrees centigrade, 98 degrees or so Fahrenheit, keeps out a lot of the fungi. Why? Because they live in the environment. They don't like very hot temperatures. And we are very hot relative to the environment. And the problem is that with climate change, we fear that some of these fungi in the environment may adapt to live at higher temperatures. And if that is the case, our temperature won't protect us. And we may be seeing new fungal diseases. In fact, there is one known Candida auris, which is a major new problem. And we can talk about that. There is some thought that it may have come as a result of climate change. Well, as you've said, fungi are known to thrive in cooler temperatures and that they're adapting and becoming more infectious to humans. How rapidly is that occurring? Well, let's talk about Candida auris. Candida auris, as the name suggests, is related to to candida, which is a well-known human pathogen. It causes uh, diseases in baby, diaper rash, it can cause candida vaginitis. But this organism was not known to medicine up until around 2009. And then it emerged in three different continents, in South America, in, in Africa, and in Asia at roughly the same time. And the isolates were not similar. That is, it's not like somebody took a plane from Asia to South America and brought it. So the, we don't have a good explanation how this thing could have emerged. But there is a lot of circumstantial evidence that it may be the first uh, organism to have adapted to higher temperatures as a result of climate or a change in global warming and does become a human pathogen. If that is the case, uh, Candida auris is the canary in the coal mine to tell us what the future may be. And that is, uh, that is something that we're all watching very carefully. Well, I don't know if you saw the picture. I'm sure you did. But a frog recently found in India had a small mushroom growing, growing out of it. its back. Yeah, yeah. So while it was not collected and tested. Why is this such a shock and should we be worried? Well, it's a shock because mushrooms, you know, don't usually cause disease. I mean, if you think about it, almost every 
fungus that causes disease is microscopic. You need, you need a microscope to look at. Uh, so that picture uh, was shocking simply by what we saw. I don't think that right now we are thinking of mushrooms growing on people uh, and causing disease like that. But I want to point out that other organisms right now are suffering tremendously from the fungi. The frogs, as you mentioned, Diana, are an example. But it wasn't from that fungus. It's from a fungus known as a chytrid that is spread throughout the world and is decimated the frogs worldwide. The salamanders in Europe are in trouble. The snakes in North America and the bats when they hibernate. In the summer, the bats are our temperature, 37 degrees, 98 degrees Fahrenheit. They're fine. However, in the winter, to get through the winter, they drop their temperature to around 12 degrees. And when that happens, a fungus can grow on them and kill them. So I think if, if we look at our relatives, you know, other animals, you know, the frogs, the salamanders, the bats, and we see how much trouble they're in. I think that that is a warning that, that, the, that the fungal world has major threats that we need to be concerned about. I want to talk about extreme weather and are these infectious fungi spreading more easily now because of that? Things like fires and dust storms. The answer is yes. Um, we, we recently published an article uh, uh, with one of my colleagues here, Daniel Smith, called Disaster Microbiology. And it argues that whenever you have a disaster, you change the microbes in the area. And sometimes that accentuates the damage. Let's think about an example that it was Will I lived through, uh, Katrina. It, Katrina flooded New Orleans. When the waters receded, mold grew on those houses. And it was so devastating that it had to be, the houses had to be demolished. What you find is that whenever <clears throat> you have a calamity, a tornado in some cases, uh, you stir up the air and you can, and survivors can get fungal diseases. That happened at Joplin uh, a few years ago, the Joplin tornado. So that is something to add to the worry list. Uh, and, but also, if we are aware of it, to the preparation list, that whenever we're dealing with a calamity, one should, one should expect changes in the microbiology, and some of those changes may bring us new diseases. Well, the human body is remarkable. Can our immune systems learn to adapt to these changes? You are so right. I mean, think about it. For most, we go through life with relatively few infectious diseases. And the reason for that is because our immune system is so effective at controlling them. If we teach our immune system many ways how to prevent disease when we, when we take a vaccine. A vaccine basically prevents one from getting the disease. And one mechanism of doing this is to develop vaccines against some of the fungi. Currently, there are no vaccines to fungi. Uh, they haven't been developed for a variety of reasons, but, but we have the know-how, we have the technology. They could be made if needed. Blood tests are used to try to find fungal infections, but they aren't reliable. At the same time, fungal pathogens are very resistant to common therapies. How are they being detected, and what's being done to try and improve treatments? You bring up a very set of very important points that are related. One of them is the problem in diagnosis and the problem in treatment. So the problem in diagnosis with, the fungal, with fungal diseases is that we have few diagnostic tests. Consequently, they are often diagnosed late after the fungus established itself in the body. Once established, it's a lot harder to get out. So then the physicians treat. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of antifungal drugs. We only have three major classes, and some of the fungi are becoming resistant. So you're now treating, but you're treating late, and oftentimes, and the fungus are very themselves very resilient. 
So you have to treat for a long time. So in contrast to many bacterial diseases where you can treat for a week, maybe two weeks, with fungal diseases, you often have to treat for months. And there is no guarantee that one will be able to clear it. So we have problems in diagnosis, and we have problems in treatment, and we have problems in relatively few drugs. What regions in the U.S. are most at risk currently, and is the threat expected to spread, Arturo? The threat of fungal diseases depends whether the fungus comes from the environment or whether it comes, uh, you know, from another host. So most fungal diseases actually come from the environment, except for things like candida, which we tend to carry with us and generally doesn't hurt us. But when we become immunosuppressed or take antibiotics or something, it could happen. So let's get to your question. In different parts of the United States, there is a different fungal diseases. In the American Southwest, there is coccidiomycosis, valley fever. It's currently restricted to the Southwest, but there is now a lot of data that is moving into other states. So doctors, even in states where historically have not seen coccidiomycosis, need to become aware of this because the first step in making a diagnosis is to think about it. In the Ohio River Valley and Mississippi River Valley, we have histoplasmosis. Again, relatively geographically limited, but it's moving into other areas. We just had a report of blastomycosis from Vermont. Blastomycosis is a very serious fungal disease that we see in the Midwest. What's it doing in Vermont? We don't know. But it is an example that things are moving. And uh, there needs to be greater awareness both by the public that, you know, that these things are moving and that they are a threat and by the medical community because the medical community needs to think about it in order to make a diagnosis. So those are regions at risk. Are there certain populations that are more at risk than others? Yes. Again, a very, very important point. Invasive fungal diseases are relatively rare in humans that have what we call intact immunity, that are immunocompetent. So people that are well, you know, if they get infected with one of these fungi, can usually control it. But we have about 7 million immunosuppressed individuals in the United States. And many of this immunosuppression is that the result of medical progress. When we treat cancer, when we treat autoimmune diseases, when we often do so, at the price of the immune system. So these individuals are often immunosuppressed. And by being immunosuppressed, they are at risk for fungal diseases. And that's the population that we often see them in. Arturo, as someone that studies microbes, how they cause disease, what can you suggest for us to do to help protect people? Is there hope for us? Absolutely. Absolutely. So in my life, I seen great progress. When I was uh, a resident in New York City in the mid 1980s, uh, learning medicine, I took care of many patients with HIV infection. We had no therapies for it. Almost everyone died. Today, we have terrific therapies for HIV, such that with with treatment, people can expect to lead a normal life. I am a big optimist, uh, and I believe that science is our best insurance policy. So continued investment in science, in biomedical sciences, will give the knowledge that would allow us to face any of these threats when they arrived. I point out to you, we just been through a COVID pandemic, and even though it was devastating, within one year, They develop rapid tests, antivirals, and vaccines. How was that possible? It was possible because previous generations had made investments in science. Arturo, thank you so much for being on the excerpt. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching. I'm Dana Taylor. I'll see you next time.